Good morning. I have a question for you to, uh, to start off. <clears throat> Just a rhetorical question. If you could have dinner with any three people on the earth, and they had to come, who would it be? You could just pick anyone. Like, I'd like to go around the room. It'd be kind of cool to hear some of your answers. Maybe you'd pick a, a celebrity or a famous actor or maybe an athlete or a musician or maybe a loved one who lives far away that you'd love to spend some more time with. I was thinking about this, and I came up with, I'd pick my favorite hockey player, Wendell Clark. I'd pick my favorite politician, Brad Wall, and I would pick one of my favorite Bible teachers, uh, Tim Keller. So if I would have uh, Wendell Clark, Brad Wall, Tim Keller, that'd be an interesting discussion. I'm not sure how that would go. Maybe it'd be better one-on-one, -on -one, but I think it would be fun to think about. Now, let's take that, but let's change it a bit. Can you imagine a setting where you would meet with anyone who has loved the Lord from the time of Adam up till present day? If you could pick any follower of the Lord right from the beginning of mankind up till now, who would it be? I was thinking about that and I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have the Apostle Peter and C.S. Lewis and, and Francis Chan and we would just sit, stand in a circle and chat? I can hardly wait. Today I will be continuing in our series on heaven. So uh, we took a break during the Christmas season and uh, one of the purposes for this according to, I'm mean, following the Apostle Paul's words from the book of Colossians. Susanna, you want to just advance it one there? Uh, Colossians 3 verse 1 says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And that is what I want you to be thinking about, dwelling on, thinking about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. So that is my hope, and I hope that will inspire you as we, uh, as we get further into this series. One question that I've been asking right, kind of from the beginning is, what happens after a follower of Jesus dies? We place the, the physical body in the ground, the soul and the spirit, the, the part of us that our mind, our will, our emotion, soul and spirit, that goes up to the present heaven. Jesus called it paradise. And when Jesus returns, we call that the second coming, which could be any time. The soul and the spirit will return into the body that it left. And Paul describes this whole event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Christians who have already died will be raised back to life, given a resurrection body. And this is the body that they will have for eternity. This is the body that will never die. Not affected by COVID, not affected by cancer, no pain. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 Paul explains that Christians who are still alive when Christ returns will receive bodies like those who were resurrected. They will join the resurrected ones, and Paul says they will meet the Lord in the air and be with the Lord forever. So that's a quick review of what we uh, talked about a while back in our series. From this point on, we'll be talking about the eternal heaven. Eternal heaven is where we'll be for eternity, which is different from the present heaven where our deceased Christian loved ones are now. And then next Sunday, we'll look at this eternal heaven a bit more. What is it? What's it like? What do we do there? What is the new Jerusalem? You ever heard that term from Revelation 21? Then we'll take a break for a couple Sundays, and then we'll come back. In part six, we'll look at judgment and rewards. How does that affect us even now? And I don't think we can talk about heaven without talking about hell. That'll be a tough one, but I believe it's necessary to talk about. So that'll be part seven, and that will close off the series. And for those of you who are missing expository sermons, the verse-by-verse the verse through the Bible, Pastor Mitchell will start us up on uh, going through the book of Colossians at the end of February. So I look forward to that, as I hope you do as well. A book that has been helpful in preparing for this series called Heaven by Randy Elkhorn, and actually our church library has it, if you ever want to take it out. Bible teacher Sean McDowell had some helpful thoughts uh, for my study today, and uh, if you ever want to check out his website, he has a lot of, uh, if you're into apologetics or you just have questions about current issues, uh, it's a great uh, resource to check out 
on his website. But today we're going to be looking at relationships in heaven. Relationships with other people. What is going to be our relationship with sin? And then finally, what is our relationship with the Lord? So before we open our Bibles further, let's, uh, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can think about a topic like this in times like these. What, what a wonderful place to put our mind. And Lord, I pray that we will be able to put our mind there and, and free from distractions that are around us even right now. Lord, I pray that this will not be a, a, a half-hour lesson, but Lord, that this can be something we take with us and, and dwell on it, as, as Paul says. And pa Father, I just pray that that can be an encouragement, a motivation, a challenge, and just bring us joy. And so I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with our relationships with people in heaven. When we stand at, the, at a fresh grave, the grave of a loved one who knew Jesus, our comfort rests in the hope, the expectation that there will be a future reunion with that loved one. And rightly so, because as I mentioned earlier, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul describes the resurrection of loved ones. And part of the reason he talks about that, or he, he writes those words, is to comfort the grieving. Some glorious day, there will be a resurrection of these loved ones. Now, Paul could have said something like, um, God will be in heaven, so comfort yourself with that. That's really all you need. And it's true, God will be in heaven, and th which definitely is a comfort for us now, but also our deceased Christian loved ones will be resurrected and also be in heaven. So the point is that relationships with fellow believers now matter because we will take them into eternity. And those, so those relationships don't just end when our Christian loved ones die. And I find that extremely comforting. Even though the time of separation between now and then can be painful. But God has made us relational, not only with himself, but also with other people. At the beginning of the Bible, we, midway through, I would say, about Genesis 2, God has finished creating, but something is not good. What was not good? Adam was alone. But he had God all to himself. If you think it does not get better than that, and yet God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And then he went to create woman, someone to be a helpmate, a partner, someone to, uh, to just spend time together, to enjoy. And remember, this is before sin entered the world. Humans were designed to need each other. A few years ago, I I flew to the States to visit a good friend of mine, uh, Rob Leonard. He, is, he spoke here before. I don't know if you remember him. He's a, he's a pastor in Arkansas, and uh, Martha didn't go along. I went alone, and I had a layover in Dallas for a couple days, and the only free night that I had, the Toronto Maple Leafs were playing the stars. I mean, and it was my birthday, so, I mean, it just doesn't get more obvious than that. I had to go, and I did. Best birthday present ever, Leafs 173. But anyway, traveling alone, it's, it's fun to be able to just do what you want, when you want, go wherever you want. And as fun as that all is, there was something missing. I had no one to enjoy it with me. There's joy in sharing experiences with someone else. And I can't imagine heaven, the ultimate place of experiences, to be enjoyed alone for eternity. Now, one could argue that God is there and that's all we need. Yes, God is there. But He made us to be relational. He made us to be relational with Himself and to be relational with other people. Being with people in heaven is not a replacement for God. It's actually, it actually can bring us more of God. I can be with some people, when, I, when I'm with some people, that there, there's a few guys I know that I can just sense they have the Spirit of God in them. I know I have a few friends who have the gift of evangelism. They love Jesus, and they love people, and it's, it's amazing to watch how that comes together. 
I have some friends who have the gift of encouragement. I just enjoy being around them. Sometimes I'm drawn closer to God by being with these guys, listening to them, watching them. I think about God more. I pray more. And that's why we're still on this sinful earth. Imagine what it will be like in sinless heaven. Our relationships with people in heaven will not compete with God. They'll bring Him glory. The only thing that we're going to take to heaven is other people. And since there won't be sin in heaven, there won't be strife, there won't be a strife between you and someone else, there won't be strained relationships, there'll be no cliques, no in crowd, because we're all the in crowd. There'll be no one will be shy, you won't have uh, a feeling of unworthiness, or it won't be awkward, you won't feel left out. In heaven, making friends will be easy, there'll be no pride, no jealousy, no embarrassment, no guilt. Let's learn more about relationships in heaven. Going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes how much he misses the church in Thessalonica, and he starts in verse 19, he says, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of the Lord, uh, in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are the glory, you are our glory and joy. What Paul is saying is that in the presence of Jesus, he will meet these, these Christian converts from, from Thessalonica and he'll be so proud of them, so filled with joy to see them in heaven. Their presence in heaven will be part of Paul's reward. And it made me think about people that we will meet in heaven who are part of our spiritual journey on this earth. And they may not, they may not even know that they had an influence on us. And there may be people in heaven who, who you had an influence on who will be there and you didn't even know you had an influence on them. The relationships will continue in heaven and that will be part of our joy and our reward. These words from 1 Thessalonians 2, they also indicate that we'll have at least some memory in heaven of what has happened on earth. So one could then ask the question, how can we enjoy heaven if we remember the bad or the evil that happened while we were on earth? I think we will remember at least some of the evil on earth, but I don't think that it will diminish heaven at all. In fact, I think it might do the opposite. After God the Father raised his son Jesus from the dead, we read in John chapter 20 that Jesus appeared to his disciples. And they didn't believe that it was Jesus until he showed them proof. Thomas wasn't there and he wouldn't believe that Jesus was alive. However, the next time that Jesus appeared to his disciples, Thomas was there. It says, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, to Thomas, he said, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now what was Jesus showing Thomas? He was showing him his scars, right? Scars in his fingers and, or his hands and in his feet from the nails when he was crucified. He was showing him the scar in his side when the soldier pierced his side with a, with a spear. This was the resurrected Jesus, the body that he ascended with into heaven and still has today. And when we go to heaven, I expect that we too will see Jesus' scars. What a waste if our memory was completely erased of everything that happened on earth and we got to heaven and we saw those scars and we wondered what's that all about. What a waste that would be. No, I believe that we will see those scars, and it'll remind us at least of some of our past for the purpose of appreciating what Christ did when he sacrificed himself on the cross and, and took that punishment of sin so that we would, he could offer us salvation. Now, I don't know how much we'll remember 
in heaven about our time here on earth, but whatever we remember won't reduce the joy in heaven because it will remind us of God's grace and mercy, His love, and I think that'll cause us to worship Him all the more. There's much more we could explore in this heading of our relationships with other people. I think I'm going to leave it at that, although there are two questions that I have wondered about, and maybe you have too. How can we enjoy heaven if we have a loved one in hell? Do babies go to heaven? And I know those are sensitive questions, and I've wondered about them too, and likely you have as well. I want to take time for them in, in parts six and seven. I won't touch them for now, but we will address them later. One question that I have also thought about is, will we be capable of sin in heaven? Satan or, or Lucifer was an angel in heaven and he sinned. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world right after they were created and they sinned. Could it happen again? There's some Bible verses I think can be helpful in this question. Romans 3.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So we see that sin is connected with death. James 4, 15. When it, when, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Again, we see sin leads to death. There's that connection. Now let's compare those two verses with Revelation 21, 4. In this, the writer is referring to the eternal heaven. He says, there will be no death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed. There's no more death in heaven. And since sin and death are connected, it must mean that there's no more sin in heaven. Alcorn wrote, those who will never die can never sin, since sinners always die. So in heaven, we will never die, because there won't be sin. The writer of Hebrews tells us Jesus came to earth to take away the death punishment of our sin. He puts it this way, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. Jesus has already paid the price for our sin here on earth. He doesn't need to pay for our sins in heaven because there will not be sin in heaven. Sin won't even be a temptation when we're in heaven. And here's two, two verse, or I should say two passages from Revelation that I think speak to this. The first one, Revelation 20 verse 10 says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and false prophet have been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. One glorious day, Satan will be thrown into hell and his influence, this evil influence that he has, will finally come to an end. Revelation 21, 27 says, Nothing impure will enter it, referring to heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, I don't know if the Lamb's book of life is, is something literal, but the point would be God knows who belongs to Him, and only those will enter into heaven. No evil person will be allowed in. Satan will be out of the picture by then, that great tempter. So, so there's no one who could tempt us. Temptations will be no more. There'll be no more evil desires. We will live in a sinless perfection of God, as one Bible teacher put it, the sinless perfection of God. It's hard to imagine that there won't be even any temptation to sin in heaven, because now we, we can be deceived by the lies of sin that it has to offer us, but in heaven we'll be fully aware of those lies. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll see the scars of Christ, and that will remind us of sin and we'll know where that leads and we will want no part of it. In heaven we'll, we'll see sin the way God sees it. Unappealing, revolting. We'll have a, a transformed 
nature. Our hearts will be pure. Sin will have lost its appeal. So in heaven, we won't be tempted by sin. The influence of temptation is removed. We'll be aware of the cost Christ paid for the penalty of our sin, and you put that all together and we'll live in an eternal, sinless uh, land of bliss. And as wonderful as that sounds, I've left, left the best for last. The best part of heaven is our relationship with God in heaven. The verse on the, the back of your bulletin, I don't have it here. You can see it on the back of your bulletin. These are the words of King David. He, write, he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Now, did David literally want to see God with his eyes? Is that what he's asking? God told Moses, You cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Jesus said God is spirit. And if God's spirit, that means he doesn't have a material body, so how can we see him? Paul wrote, the sun is the image of the invisible God. So it sounds like God himself says that no one can see his face, plus he's spirit and invisible. And why does, so then why does John write, and he's referring to, uh, to heaven, he says in Revelation 22, 4, he says, they will see his face, his referring to God. Why would he say that if God is invisible? Now, we are not able to see God now in these perishable bodies. His glory would be too overwhelming. It, it, would, it would kill us. In the book of Hebrews, we read this, Holy, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, one definition I found for holiness is sinless. We are made holy through Christ's once-for-all sacrifice. Revelation 20, verse 4, refers to those who do see God. These will be people with resurrected, sinless bodies. And I believe that will include us. Now, what will we actually see if God doesn't have a body? No one can truly understand how or in what form, but somehow God will reveal His face to our physical eyes. Whatever that is, I don't know, but I, I expect it will be truly awesome. Jesus told His disciples, anyone, can, anyone who see, has seen me has seen the Father. So the primary way we will see God the Father in heaven is through Jesus Christ, His Son, who has a resurrected physical body that you can see and touch. Now, can you imagine if this evening we would say, Jesus is going to be sitting right down here. You can come and talk to Him. You can line up. You can, like, we're talking Jesus, the Redeemer of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, the Creator of the universe, is going to be sitting right there, and you can come and talk to him. I mean, that would blow your mind. Imagine what it would be like to do that anytime you wanted, for all eternity. That's what it'll be like. That's the best part of heaven. And we'll never lose our fascination for God because we're not omniscient. I don't believe we'll ever fully understand who God is. There'll always be more to discover. Whatever we do understand about Him will be truth. Because this is heaven. There's no distortion. There's no twisting the truth. There's no cults. There will always be more to discover about the Lord. We'll never get tired of Him. The thrill of spending time with Jesus in heaven will far surpass any adrenaline rush that any extreme sport today could offer you. Don't you desire to have that relationship with God now? I think you'd be crazy not to. Now I've got you all excited, but you have to wait till Christ returns or you die, whichever comes first. I know that sounds like kind of a downer, but wait a minute. We can get a taste of enjoying a relationship with God now, not the same as it will be in heaven, 
This is just a taste. We can enjoy God now by taking pleasure in what He has given us. Don't you think it gives God pleasure when you enjoy reading a book or skiing in nature like I did yesterday or having fun with family or enjoying friends or, or enjoying a hobby or your work? As long as we enjoy these God-given gifts in a way that doesn't dishonor God. Martha and I were watching a food show last week and uh, the host tasted something, and he had, all of a sudden he had this big smile, and he's just moaning and groaning, oh, this is so good, and he's mumbling, and he's just raving about how good the food is. And I thought, that's it. That's it. That's how you take pleasure in a gift that God has given you, in this case, the gift of food, by showing appreciation, and sure, you can show appreciation to the chef, but mostly showing appreciation and thanking God for that gift. Listen, if you, if you give your child a gift, don't you want to see them enjoy it? Doesn't it give you pleasure watching your child enjoy what you have given them? Recognize and acknowledge that God is the source of all that we enjoy. We can draw closer to Him by partaking in these gifts that He's given us here on earth, as long as we don't use them as a replacement for God. The best part of heaven is not seeing our loved ones who have died before us, although that'll be great. I'm going to give my dad a big hug. The best part of heaven is not being rid of the, the temptation to sin and, and the battle that we have with sin, although that will be awesome. The best part of heaven is spending time with the Lord Jesus, our Savior. And with that, I'll call on the uh, worship team to come lead us in our closing song.